This is Patrick Scott. Welcome to Political Science 101, American Democracy and Citizenship. Today we're going to be discussing the media and various aspects about the media. One of the things that we're going to cover, for example, is the degree to which is there a liberal bias in the media. We'll be talking about topics like that, topics such as uh, government regulation of the media, the increasing influence of the media in terms of our, our influencing our political system. So a lot of interesting topics today that we're going to be talking about. Um, Obviously, as we start out, we talk about the changing role of television. We have seen that television over time has had increasingly an impact on our political system. And a lot of times when people discuss this issue, the first point that they go back to is the Kennedy-Nixon debates in 1960. And as you may know, uh, that was the first televised presidential debate and, in our history. And the interesting thing about that is, um, as, you, as you know, um, a lot of people, if you may have read about this historically, um, the people who saw this debate on TV tended to go with John F. Kennedy. Those who heard the debate on radio thought that Richard Nixon did better. But when you saw it on TV, uh, during that time Richard Nixon refused to wear makeup <clears throat> and he came across as, as kind of white and you know, kind of pasty and he was sweating, you could see he was kind of nervous and agitated, while John F. Kennedy came across on camera as being very suave, uh, debonair, sophisticated, uh, uh, had very good control of the issues. And so because of that, a lot of people say that that really swung the debate, uh, swung the, the election in favor of John F. Kennedy, and that's why he won by a slight margin during that time. And um, because we had a number of people by that point in time had televisions in their households, and uh, so increasingly more and more people did see this on, on television. Uh, but again, it, regardless of whether or not the TV was the reason and the televised debate was the reason sh for shifting the vote or not, I think everyone would agree that that was a very important milestone or watershed in terms of showing how the broadcast media has come to play a very influential role in shaping our political system. As you know, TV is very important <clears throat> because it provides a direct link between politicians and the voters. Uh, and so it has changed the landscape of American politics. And certainly it's, it's given an enormous impact on both the shape and the power of the media. Um, one of the first questions we like to come to when we talk about this topic is whether or not, uh, you know, can we trust the media? Does the media manipulate stories? And particularly, we, that reminds me, it brings us to the topic about whether or not news stories are objective and specifically is there a liberal bias in the media. Um, oftentimes we, he we hear this on TV and radio and, and newspapers about there being a liberal bias in the media. Is there, there's a liberal bias among journalists and other news personnel. Many people actually question the objectivity of news stories because members of the national media often have political views that may be somewhat more liberal than the average citizen. And some studies have even shown that editors and reporters and TV producers and commentators are far more liberal than voters in general. Now, um, in fact, if you can, you, there are even some studies and some statistics that people allude to showing how much more likely journalists are to vote Democratic and express more liberal positions. And in fact, there's a graphic that I'm showing you right now. This is taken uh, way back in 1985, a Los Angeles Times uh, poll looking at the differences and viewpoints between journalists and the public. This is a somewhat dated poll, and other polls have actually since then have corroborated these results. But this is one of the most, uh, the first, one of the most famous polls that look at this issue, and that's why a lot of researchers and uh, political scientists will, will go back to this poll just to show you uh, the, some of the differences between those. So, for example, um, look at the differences in terms of the ideology between journalists and the republic. As you see from the graphic right now, Journalists are showing that 55% of them identify themselves as liberal in this poll, where only 23% of the public did. And by contrast, 17% of journalists identified themselves as conservative versus 29% of the public. And then on certain issues that have a liberal versus conservative kind of dimension to them, favor government regulation of business. As you see, more journalists in the public favored that. Um, U.S. should withdraw investments from South Africa. Back then, then that was a very important issue and you saw um, more journalists than the public favored that. Um, the question of abortion, 82% versus 49%. Allowing prayer in public schools, you see here, 25% versus 74% of the public believed in that. 
Affirmative action, 81 verses 56. Death penalty, 47 verses 75. Stricter handgun controls, you see 78 versus 50 percent. Increased defense to bu budget, 15 versus 38 percent. And favor hiring homosexuals, 89 versus 55. Now again, this is a bit dated of a poll, but again, more recent polls have actually shown some of the same ideas. And what I'm trying to suggest to you from this um, is the idea that journalists have, in this poll, have shown to favor more liberal positions than the public as a whole. And so um, a lot of people have suggested that what we need to do is uh, recognize the fact that journalists do have that, that more of a self-described ideology as being liberal and perhaps even in terms of hiring of journalists, maybe there ought to need to be some quote, what, what one person said, as good old affirmative action to, to even out the balance in terms of people's ideologies. Um, other people, however, suggest that the real bias is not so much of, of a liberal bias as much of a corporate bias. Because if you think about who owns some of the major broadcast stations, for example, NBC is owned by General Electric. Who owns ABC? The Mouseketeers. ABC is owned by Disney. Um, CNN is owned by Time Warner. Just to give you some examples, I think CBS is owned by Westinghouse. So the people who really run the show are not the reporters, but the general managers, the advertising directors, the publishers, and the owners. And, and so therefore, uh, presumably, you, know, you, you, receive, you see more of their bias reflected in terms of the content of news stories. And all of the supposedly diverse uh, channels that are, you see on cable, uh, they are designed to give you more and more options, but they, they are also owned by some of the same kinds of corporate uh, conglomerates as, as uh, General Electric. Um, the book notes that other poll data show that almost two-thirds of the press consider themselves moderate rather than liberal or conservative, especially when you consider local as well as national journalists. But nonetheless, what I'm trying to suggest to you at this point, is there a liberal bias? Maybe yes. Now we haven't even talked about other, the fact that a lot of there are other newscasts, news stations such as um, Fox. That's clearly not not liberal. Uh, if you look at newspapers, you've got both liberal and and uh, conservative newspapers. I like to think about the Washington Post versus the Washington Times. Um, you th I think about the New York Times versus the Wall Street Journal. Again, so so, so you have you have both sides of the ideological spectrum covered in the content of news stories. But nonetheless. Let's just go around on this path here for a second. Let's say that, okay, so by and large, maybe there is a slight liberal bias, uh, if not more than slight, that you see among uh, journalists who, who, who are uh, reporting the news. Now, the second question that brings into mind then is that, is this. If this bias, I mean, if this bias that does exist, if it does exist, is it really reflected in news stories? And again, I think the answer is somewhat yes, somewhat no. One thing I know is that there are certain professional criteria to which journalists must adhere. It's part of their professional training as a journalist. Um, and some of these, I think, help to moderate the extent to which any bias that does exist would come out. Let me give you an example. The need to meet an urgent deadline. If there is something that's going on very, very quickly and you're, you're, qu you're trying to get out the news uh, to, to, to meet this deadline, uh, it's going to be very, very difficult to try to, to, to deliberately and calculatively try to incorporate any kind of bias or slant in that story. Now, you might say, well, it's going to come out naturally, but not necessarily. Uh, but the need to meet an urgent deadline might be a way that moderates any bias that does exist, if it does exist. A uh, second uh, point, the desire to attract an audience. Um, we, we have to remember that the news corporations are profit-driven. And their profits are driven by the degree to which they attract an audience. And if they are continually providing news that alienates an audience, their profits are going to go down. So again, by this, this desire, this need, again, this corporate bias may be coming into play. That need to attract an audience is going to moderate whatever ideological tendencies you may see being expressed by, by journalists. And I think even more importantly, the training that journalists go through, the professional obligation to be fair and to tell the truth, as far as the reporting of stories is concerned, that is part of their professional training. And the more training that they have, the higher education that you go into, and this actually happens in a lot of different fields, by the way, not just journalism, but other fields too. Uh, when you're moving from, a, from an undergraduate degree to a graduate degree, 
you know, the, the professional codes that are associated with, with uh, of conduct uh, become more paramount in terms of guiding the way you look at the world and guiding your practice. And the same thing applies certainly with, with, uh, with you know, with all professionals. Um, certainly in terms of physicians, um, in terms of journalists, the idea of, of, of the professional obligation to be fair in terms of how you're reporting. And if you're not, uh, you will be castigated by those in your profession as being, as being biased. Now, we also need to make sure that we understand that we're talking about news stories and not editorials. Editorials that you may see on either TV or, or read in the newspapers. Those are deliberately written with a viewpoint to try to influence and persuade. But what I'm talking about right now is simply the reporting of news stories. All right? So, where are we at this point? Is there a bias among the media? Maybe yes, maybe no. There's some empirical data to suggest, maybe yes. Number two, if that bias is there, is it reflected in news stories? Maybe yes, but on the other hand, there are moderating factors that, mo that, that reduce the degree to which any bias can really occur, what we've just talked about here. Um, and in fact, a lot of those, those lines, journalists argue that they're not trying to reflect a bias by any means. They're simply serving as a mirror to society. Uh, as one journalist recently stated, the news is not a reporter's perception of what happens, it is simply what happens. Nonetheless, let me give you a third point. All right. If there's a bias, is it reflected? Maybe yes, maybe not. Third point. Most importantly, even if there is a liberal bias, and this is where the rubber meets the road here, does this bias really affect what you believe? And I think this is the most important criteria to consider when, when we're talking about bias. There are basically here, again, moderating factors that influence, that, that, that reduce the degree to which the media can influence your views, all right, that limit the media's ability to influence our political beliefs, all right. Let me give you the first factor. There's something called selective exposure. What selective exposure basically says is this, it's, it's a psychological concept. And basically what this means is that you as a person screen out things, items, whatever you see, that you, you tend to screen those things out. You don't pay attention to the things that you don't agree with, but you do pay attention to the things that you do agree with. All right? So basically what that means here is that if you see a story that fundamentally challenges your values or your assumptions, particularly those that go at core values, you're not going to pay attention to those, those, those stories. Um, on the other hand, those types of news items that comport or reinforce some of those core values that you may hold, those are the things you're going to pay attention to and those are the things you're going to remember. All right? Now, a lot of studies have been shown, uh, psychological, social psychology studies have shown that the selective exposure does operate and they've shown how this actually happens in so many different contexts. And one of the reasons why people engage in selective exposure is because they want to avoid another concept psychologists have provided, something called cognitive dissonance. You engage in selective exposure to avoid cognitive dissonance. And that is basically, it's very hard for us in our mind to embrace contradictions. We may live in a world of contradictions, we may act in contradictory ways at times, but it's very, very hard for us to continually operate in a fashion where we are embracing contradictions. So we try to avoid contradictions because that creates this idea of cognitive dissonance. And selective exposure is a mechanism by which helps us to avoid cognitive dissonance. So again, my point here is this. If we engage in selective exposure, then the media, and this is important to understand, the media tend to reinforce our previously held attitudes. It doesn't challenge our thinking as much as it reinforces our biases. All right, now let me give you a quick example of that too. Um, some of the people that I've, I've seen on TV and, the, and also in, in print, who are most likely to scream liberal bias. Look at who these people are. These are the people who are least likely to be influenced by a liberal bias. Those who yell the loudest about a liberal bias are those who are least likely to be influenced by a liberal bias. All right, so anyway, so the point here is oh, I do believe that selective exposure is a moderating fa factor. So whether you're actually conservative or liberal, basically what happens because of selective exposure, the media do tend to reinforce our previously held beliefs. It tends to reinforce, it doesn't challenge our thinking as much as it reinforces our own biases. All right, now no, let me give you another, another moderating factor. 
that limits the ability of the media to influence our beliefs. This is the idea that the text talks about in terms of familiarity. Certainly, the more familiar you are with a story, the more you have personal knowledge of the facts, naturally, the less likelihood that your opinion is going to be influenced by the media. Okay, so if you've been, if you've been studying an issue, if you understand an issue very, very well, uh, then whatever news stories you see, either pro or con, regarding that particular issue, you're not going to be as much influenced by it because you, you have your own separate independent source of understanding uh, with that. So again, that limits the media's ability to influence your beliefs. The more familiarity you have with a story or an item, the less the media has an ability to influence your beliefs in that area. A third argument that you can make in terms of a moderating factor is the fact that we do have right now so many different sources uh, to choose from. Uh, we have the whole, if you, with, with, with the explosion, not only of, of all the different cable choices uh, you know, or satellite uh, TV stations, uh, all the different channels there, uh, so many different uh, stations that have such a wide range of viewpoints, uh, so many different news stories, and certainly uh, newspapers, and also uh, certainly with the internet and, and blogs and those kinds of things, there's a whole gamut of opinions and viewpoints that are expressed. Now, of course, the point here is if you take your advantage of a variety of, of things to look at, then that will certainly mean that you're less likely to be influenced by any one particular uh, form of, of uh, uh, media. On the other hand, again, what I typically see is that I, I talk to individuals and I ask them what, you know, if I ask them what, what channels, what news channels do they, particular, that, do they like to watch, you see a high correlation with the particular slant of the news channel with the types of blogs that they look at. And that goes back to my point earlier about selective exposure. They typically focus on those things that reinforce their beliefs, be they liberal or conservative, as opposed to try to avail themselves of all the different kinds of uh, opportunities that are out there to, to, to avail themselves of. And then the fourth moderating factor, and again, you cannot underscore the point here about this, and that is, the news tends to have very little substantive content. Um, if you look particularly at the broadcast news, you know, when you're, when you're looking at the broadcast news on a, on a given evening, on a 30 minute segment, for, after the commercials, you're really talking about 22 minutes, and it covers a whole gamut of, of events, and each particular thing that's covered may only, only be about a, uh, you know, a two minute segment. So to the degree that you have two minutes to report a story, how much substantive content is there that's going to influence you? It's very, very little. Um, so, so because of that, you, you don't see a whole lot. Now, I'll give you an example here, too, about how the different stations take, take uh, 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 treat this. Um, you can have, uh, for example, the CBS, ABC, and NBC uh, evening news. And I have seen in the past where they have covered candidates or issues. Let's say, for example, in terms of presidential campaigns, they've covered, covered issues. And it's an interesting contrast between them and other shows we have a little more time, like, for example, um, uh, on PBS, The News Hour with, with Jim Lehrer. Uh, I'll give you just a quick, quick example of this. Um, I have seen them cover, the, the three major networks uh, cover, cover a, can, a campaign, and they will basically just focus on just a little bit of a sound bites that they think attracts the audience, that the audience wants to hear, whereas PBS, for example, might give you a little bit more detailed coverage of the entire speech. And uh, nowhere was that even more paramount than several years ago, um, back in 1996, many, many years ago, Bob Dole was running for president. Bob Dole, former senator from Kansas, former Republican Senate Majority Leader, he was running against Bill Clinton when Bill Clinton was running for re-election in 1996. And interestingly, um, when, he, when uh, a particular time when, when he was campaigning, um, there was a time when Bob Dole was addressing, I think, some issues about gun control and, and, and reducing crime in the neighborhoods and things like that. But what happened at this particular uh, speech, Bob Dole, there was a platform. The platform gave way and Bob Dole fell down into the audience. And he was okay, uh, but that was, uh, that was basically the news story. And if you watched, interestingly, if you watched the three major networks that evening, you would basically, you could have easily captioned that story as, I saw an old man fall down today. But of course, that was a very interesting, and you want to make sure he was safe and all that, so I can understand why they'd report that. That same piece of information was covered, uh, that same uh, campaign uh, uh, segment was covered by PBS, and PBS actually had more time to devote to it, since it was an hour-long show, and uh, they actually talked more substantively about Bob Dole's positions on crime and on gun control and things like that. So the real focus in that case was actually on his, his policy views about crime. 
Incidentally, he happened to fall down. But that was not the focus of the story. The focus of the story was actually his policy positions, whereas the, the networks actually focused more on the, 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 the little sound bite. Now, so what I'm suggesting how I, to you basically is that there, these four factors, selective exposure, familiarity, the availability of so many sources to choose from, and certainly the fact that news has very little substantive content, are all moderating factors that basically uh, influence, that, that reduce the, the media's ability to influence our beliefs, all right? So even if there is a bias, and I'm not saying there isn't, I think, again, I think there's biases, all kinds of biases. You see a corporate bias, a conservative bias, and a liberal bias, but whatever the bias is, does that bias really influence your beliefs? And I think those moderating, those four moderating factors I just suggested really limit the media's ability to influence your beliefs. Now, we're not going to let them get off so easy there, are we? Because there are times clearly the media can have an impact on your beliefs. Naturally, logically, what follows from this? Well, if there's an issue with which you are unfamiliar, you don't have much knowledge on, or you don't have a strong opinion on, then the media can have an impact in shaping your views. There's no doubt about that. But I think the bottom line is this. This idea of the media manipulation, uh, I think it's an exaggeration of media power. We're giving the media way too much credit th than we should. The media do not change people's attitudes, but the media coverage does have a significant effect on what people think about. And so I think that's why it's, it's, that's, that's where you really do see the, the, the uh, impact of the media. Um, now let me move over and talk a little bit about some other issues in terms of the different roles played by the media as part of this. Uh, there are essentially three basic important roles that the media does play um, in, in, as it broadcasts its news. So let me, let me give you these three, these three examples. The first important role that the media plays is this idea of a gatekeeper. If you think about what a gatekeeper is, a gatekeeper basically has control over what information comes in, what information doesn't come in. So the, the, this is where the media can be very influential. It can influence what news items are important, which ones become national political issues, and for how long. I mean, if you think about what's on the, on the TV news, the first few items on the TV news, that's the most important. If you look at uh, a, a, a newspaper, what's on the front page, what's the headlines on the front page versus the back page. There may be some coup, uh, you know, military coup or takeover by the military in some country, maybe down in South America that we may not even be aware of because it's on the back page, it's not on the front page. So in that re regard, by deciding what to report and what not to report, or by deciding what to emphasize and what to de-emphasize, the media play a very important role in terms of defining our political reality. So we basically, uh, I was quoting a, 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 famous, a reporter saying that they see journalists as essentially a mirror to society holding up what's going on. Well, according to this conception, the argument I'm making here, that role is not so much of a mirror, but that role of a gatekeeper is like the idea of a filter. Uh, they don't simply just reflect society, but they actually serve. That gatekeeping role basically means that the media serve as a filter for us in terms of defining for, you know, what is important, what are the issues that we should be thinking about, and therefore what, the issues, what are the issues that we are thinking about. So that's one important role that the media plays, certainly. Another one, a role that, that the media plays is pretty important, and this often comes up particularly during campaigns, but not always, and this is the idea of scorekeeper. And what I mean by scorekeeper, it, it actually ha has a couple of different connotations. Uh, you may think about campaigns and elections as a horse race. A lot of people talk about the horse race nature of politics. You know, who's leading in the polls today? You know, who's ahead? Who's leading? Who's got the most delegate counts? You know, who's got the, mo who's got the most votes? So that's kind of like a horse race. Or if you, and if you think of we'll when we, later on we talk about primaries and uh, um, campaigns and elections, we'll be talking about the different kinds of elections and, and, and how that horse race nature comes into play. But in that regard, uh, the media do a, a play a very important role in terms of helping to inform us who's leading um, and who's likely going to, to win particular elections, things like that. So that's one aspect of, of scorekeeper, this kind of horse race kind of connotation. But the second one is the idea of keeping tabs on politicians. And that is um, watching politicians and following them and just, you know, reporting things that uh, might actually make or break their political reputations. I mean, if there's a scandal going on, uh, 
Uh, certainly we think about, for, for example, Bill Clinton and his impeachment process. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in lying under oath regarding an affair with uh, Paula Jones and Monica Lewinsky, uh, uh, the impeachment process that surrounded that with Monica Lewinsky. Um, these are the kinds of things that where the media as scorekeeper can make or break politicians' careers. Um, more recently, uh, John Edwards. John Edwards was being considered at one point, was running for the president, and he, and he, and he uh, in, in 2004, he ran um, uh, again in the primary and uh, was the vice presidential candidate with, with John Kerry. Uh, more recently, he was running for president, and of course, there was a scandal that came out about him having an affair. Also, not too long ago, there was uh, the, 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 the story about a governor from South Carolina having an affair, and he, and he left to go down to Argentina while he was governor. No, no one even knew where he was. But these are the kinds of things, this is where the media are playing, you know, they're, they're doing their investigative journalism, trying to find out what's really going on, getting to the bottom of these stories, and the process of doing so, uh, they're playing this role of scorekeeper, and they may very, very well make or break political careers, and this happened throughout our history. Um, so that can be an important role for the media, too, to kind of keeping tabs on politicians, all right? Now, a third one, I think this is also a very important role that the media play, and this is the, this is the idea of watchdog. The media can investigate scandals, um, they, they can investigate in individuals, expose scandals, report on government mismanagement, and there are lots of examples you may see in the news where, the, where for example, uh, you may, I remember several years ago, NBC News would have uh, a segment at the end of their show on some evenings called The Fleecing of America, how government is wasting your, your money as a taxpayer. Um, I've seen some other, uh, you know, other news shows do that as well, but they, they show examples of perhaps what, you know, those kinds of things that are going on, or by reporting on some kind of scandal going on in government. Again, that can be an issue that, uh, again, is, is a very, very important role they play. I think that watchdog role is a very legitimate role. You think about this, too. You know, we live in a de democracy, and our media are not owned by the government. Instead, they're, they're private enterprise, which is good because if the media are owned by the government, many countries where the media is controlled exclusively by the government, the government controls the media. And therefore, the government uses the, the media as a tool for propaganda. And um, it's really interesting because I remember many, many years ago, for example, uh, during the time when the Soviet Union had the Iron Curtain and there was all these you know, Soviet control over all the Eastern European countries, um, I was in Romania, and this is the time when they had the dictator uh, Ceausescu. And uh, I noticed when I was there, um, all the people at night were never at home watching TV. They knew that if they were to watch TV, they're just getting, getting basically propaganda about that, that showed all the glories of the dictator. And so uh, they, they didn't watch TV. They were always outside and chatting and things like that instead of staying at home watching TV, like Americans do, because they recognized that all they were getting is propaganda. Um, but the watch, that, and that's because the government owned the media and it controlled the media and used the media for propaganda purposes. So you need to have a watchdog. You need to have an independent, free media. That's part of the, the, the thing that's guaranteed, one of the freedoms that's guaranteed in our Constitution in the First Amendment, freedom of the press. The watchdog role has a very legitimate role. It helps to keep government accountable for its actions. And that's very important. And it, I, I cannot emphasize that enough. We need to help keep government accountable for what they do. But at the same time, I do think there's a bit of a downside to that watchdog role. If you think about this, what is it that you hear over and over again from the media, the downside? I think the problem here is that, in that as the media exercise that watchdog role, it, you can get the, the impression that government is completely and utterly inept or corrupt. Um, because what gets reported? The stories that, you know, the sensational aspects gets, uh, get reported because the sensational things are the things that grab the attention of the viewers. So, you're not going to hear, for example, something on the news that, uh, oh, the Social Security Administration increased their processing efficiencies and saved taxpayer dollars to, to the tune of several million per year because they increased their processing efficiencies in Social Security checks from 98% in accuracy from 98% to 99.3%. That just doesn't really sell it on the news. That doesn't really grab your attention. Yes, they have, you, we have found that the government saves taxpayers millions of dollars through those increased efficiencies, but why report that? That's not very interesting. So in a lot of ways, 
uh, you have to understand that watchdog role, the downside of that watchdog role is we tend to see stories m by far toward those that are sensationalistic. You know, is there scandal? Is there corruption? You know, what's going to grab our attention? What's going to tickle our ears? And that's, that's, I guess, perhaps the one downside of that watchdog role played by the media. And what worries me sometimes is that I think it does, a, a does the average citizen a bit of a disservice because I think it breeds cynicism toward government. Because if you ask the average person on the street, what do you think about government? Is the government doing a good job? If you ask it in a very, very kind of generic way, they're going to say, no, they're corrupt. Or, you know, we're just simply going to elect one set of crooks for another set of crooks. You know, and you hear these kinds of real negative views about government. And I think some of that, you know, it, bureaucracy, bureaucracy is too big, too bloated, and those kinds of things. And I think some of that sense of, of government and that, those negative connotations that we have toward government are, in fact, somewhat fed by the media playing that watchdog role. As legitimate of a role it is, unfortunately, this might be one of the, one of the downsides to that role. Um, and is there an answer to this? No, not really, because I, obviously the media should not be cutting back on that watchdog role. It's a very legitimate role that it plays in our society. But it would be nice if it was a little bit more balanced in terms of what it covered so that you see a broader scope of what's really going on. So you don't just hear, hear the things that grabbed our attention. But then it would lose its, uh, a lot of revenue because the ratings uh, would, would go down as well. Um, so, but those, those are some important roles <clears throat> that the media plays in our society. Let me give you something else here too that I think are important in terms of the role of the media. Okay? And this is the idea of agenda setting. We're going to be talking about public policy way down, down the road, but for now, what I mean by this, there is something that uh, political scientists talk about called a policy agenda. And it's not like a set agenda of things to do. They, it's not like politicians say, this is what we're going to do. But oftentimes, <clears throat> the policy agenda are items and issues that are of uh, significant importance and they get the, in, in, the attention of government officials. Something may happen, some event may happen, and all of a sudden it becomes part of the policy agenda. Something may be going on in another country that they're posing some danger to our safety and our security. It may become part of the policy agenda. The media can play a very important role in terms of being an agenda setter. And this is, again, a, an important thing. Um, the, the media plays a role in this regard because of the basis of stories that they choose to cover or not cover. This, is, again, goes to that gatekeeper role. Those stories that they choose to cover may be very important. And there are some stories that are covered that the media investigate, you know, that, that, that they, they cover. It could be government, it could be something else going on. But they choose to report certain items. Citizens watch these things, and then they, in turn, feel very strongly about these items as well, particularly if they're not very familiar with them to begin with, and they see some things that are going on, and they, they think that some kind of action needs to be taken. Well, citizens, in turn, then press government officials to take action on these issues. So government officials may respond to the citizen request to do something. You see a report on poverty. You see a report on, on um, children in the United States under, you know, being severely malnourished. And you're thinking, my goodness, are we living in a developing country where you see this in other, other countries as well? Uh, are here in the United States? Maybe the government needs to do something. And so citizens will press these issues upon politicians and politicians and other government officials will then begin to address these issues. So the point here is this. This is the media playing a pretty important role here in terms of influencing the political agenda. In choosing what to report or what not to report makes it very, you know, can have an impact in terms of what actually gets on the government agenda. What gets the attention of government officials? And that, again, can be a very important role uh, the media plays in terms of setting the political agenda. And interestingly enough, too, it's also, when, when I talk about this, it's also interesting to point out uh, the relative advantage that the president has over Congress in terms of setting this agenda because, or, or in terms of how the, the president can actually use the media. We're talking about the media influencing uh, government officials. Now let me go the other way around. Uh, we can also talk about how government officials actually can influence, um, play a role in terms of, or use the media to their advantage. Uh, I think about the president versus Congress. In this case, the president, much more than Congress, has a greater ability to use the media as a tool to promote his political agenda, his, his policy agenda. Because since he is seen as the national leader of our country, 
uh, he naturally is going to get much more attention than any one individual member of Congress, okay, or Congress as a whole. Um, so because of that, that's a real advantage that the president has in terms of being able to use the media to advance his policy agenda. So we see here sort of a two-way relationship. On the one hand, the media influencing government uh, by what it reports to citizens, and it's indirectly where citizens then influence, you know, press upon government to make changes. So that's an indirect influence on the, on the policy agenda. But then we see the other way around where politicians and government officials, uh, in this case more often the president than Congress, actually having the ability to use the media because they're naturally covered in terms of what they want to promote and talk about and they have these news conferences um, and, and through that they can advance their policy agenda so they have a, they, they, that, that can be used, a very useful tool for the president in particular to advance um, his policy agenda. Okay, so we've talked about, you know, is there a liberal bias in the media? What are the ways in which the media are effective or not effective? Okay. Um, let's talk about one other, other thing here along these same lines too, and that is when you're a journalist and you're deciding what kinds of stories to report, um, what kinds of factors do you use for selecting news stories? And there are a few uh, important issues here, and, and again, some ma major factors that journalists use, and some of these are actually kind of reinforce each other, but what are, the, what are basically the four factors journalists consider in terms of what gets selected to be reported, or what gets some, the, at the top of the news hour versus what gets relegated to the back, uh, what's the front headlines of the paper versus the back page. The first factor, uh, is does the particular story have a high impact on the audience? Um, is the story relevant to people's lives? Is there the presence of violence or conflict or disaster or scandal? I mean, all of these are high impact item, items. And if they have a high impact, then they're gonna get more attention relative to other items that have low impact. And again, a scandal versus a story about processing social security checks Obviously, the scandal is going to have more of a higher impact on you than, 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 the, uh, than the latter uh, news story. So is there a high impact on the audience? That's one of the factors that journalists will use for selecting a news story. Again, familiarity. Do you know the people involved? Um, if you know this person, the person's famous. If, it's a, you know, if you're talking about the president, for example, the president or, uh, is always, or the vice president, or much more likely, or the secretary of state, are much more likely to get some kind of news stories covering them than say a Supreme Court justice, um, unless there's a scandal, of course, in which case that changes. But in other words, do you, how well do you know the people involved? The greater you have familiarity of, of the people involved, then the more likely stories about those people are likely to get reported by the news. Um, local events or at least national events are likely to get covered more than international. All right, so I put local and national together because if you're comparing national versus international stories, you're more likely to get national and uh, certainly in your local markets, local events much more than international. And even in terms of local markets, you're going to hear local news first before you start hearing about national news. Um, there's, if, you, if you look at the content, how news stories are created, unless again there's, there's some kind of, some, some kind of uh, story that's grabbing your attention because of scandal or violence or something like that, uh, you're going to get more of a local story as opposed to national, or and certainly a national before international. Um, and then a fourth one, is, and that is, is the story timely and is it news breaking? Kind of goes back to that first point, but is there something going on, breaking news, that you need to know about? And often, often that point number four goes hand in hand with that point number one, because breaking news often has the presence of violence or conflict or disaster or scandal or something like that, so it can be very timely. Uh, as, as well. So to the extent though, all things being, being equal, you have a story that's more news breaking versus one that's, you know, oh yeah, we're going to eventually get to talking about some analysis of, of uh, some policy that the government has looked at in terms of logging in the Northwest. You know, you're probably going to hear that news breaking story before you hear the story about logging in the Northwest. So anyway, so those are four factors that journalists use in terms of selecting their news stories. All right? Now we're covering a, a lot of different topics about the role of the media, and it would be very important for us to also include a little bit of discussion about government regulation of the media. We were talking about before in many countries that were under communist control or under dictatorships, under, even today under dictatorship, the media is controlled by the government. 
to advance the interests of the government. In the United States, where we have a free and independent press, is there a lot of government regulation in the media? And the answer is no. Now, we do have the primary mechanism that we use to regulate the media is a Federal Communications Commission, the FCC. It was created in 1934, and its purpose is basically twofold. Number one, the FCC's purpose is to monitor and regulate the airwaves. And also, it issues uh, licenses to broadcasters. But again, it doesn't regulate a whole lot. It doesn't say, I mean, it tries to encourage, for example, uh, shows uh, during prime time to be family friendly. But even then, you know, some of the shows may have questionable content that parents say, this is not really what I consider to be family friendly, but nonetheless gets on there. And, and you know, there's not really a whole lot that, that people, you know, that, that, media, that the government tries to do about that through the FCC. Now, there is one place in which you do see uh, more regulation by the government, and that is something called the equal time rule. Okay, and this is where basically is as follows. Broadcasters who are uh, providing uh, advertisements on their stations, they are required by the equal time rule. In fact, the equal time rule is not really the best way of putting it. I'd, put it, I'd really call it something else like the equal rate rule. It's a bit of a misnomer, but nonetheless, the equal time rule requires broadcasters who are permitting a candidate uh, running for office uh, to provide a campaign commercial on their station, um, it, such as a, you know, like a paid advertisement. That broadcaster is required to allow equal time at identical rates to other candidates running for the same office. So for example, um, if uh, I am running for mayor here in Springfield and um, I am uh, wanting to run advertisements on the local TV stations, the broadcast managers of those stations are required, the, t the station managers are required to provide me the same rate and the same time slots available as maybe my candidate. Even if they disagree with my, my politics or they disagree with my opponent's politics, they need to treat us fairly. There has to be a level, fair playing field. They can't put one candidate on at 3 o'clock in the morning and give the other candidate the one that they like, you know, prime time slots at half the price. So again, that, because that would be clearly a violation of the equal time rule. Uh, so that is, that is one of the requirements where you do see some government regulation uh, coming into play. But again, this really applies primarily to advertisements. Um, if you are a broadcaster and you sell, give or sell time to one candidate for office, you must give or sell equal time to that candidate's opponent. Another issue that used to be in, uh, come into play it is not an issue anymore, but you may have heard this term before, called the Fairness Doctrine. Um, so many years ago, this was a requirement that basically said this. Um, it, it obliges broadcasters to pre present both sides of a controversial issue, oh, okay, if it's a public issue. So basically the idea of this is that if one person comes on a station, like during an, a, an editorial show or an editorial segment of the news, and gives an opinion about one particular issue and gives one side of the issue, under the fairness doctrine, um, the broadcasters were obliged to seek out the views of other people who disagreed with those editorial opinions of the station. In other words, if you're gonna present one view on TV, you've gotta present the other view. Um, and for a while that was in place, but in, in 1986, for example, a federal court held that the Federal Communications Commission did not have to enforce the Fairness Doctrine. And in 1987, Congress passed a law requiring the FCC to enforce the Fairness Doctrine, but President Reagan at the time vetoed that. So the Fairness Doctrine really hasn't been in place since the mid-80s the mid or so. But it has, uh, the issue surfaces every now and then. But the bottom line here, I think, is the fact that because there are so many different sources to choose from, if you don't like one particular set of opinions that are expressed on one particular station at a particular point in time, you can certainly change the channel and flip to another, other opinions that are, that are on the opposite side of the issue as well. So that's why the Fairness Doctrine no longer really does play as influential role as it did before. Um, besides that, let's talk about a few other things in terms of uh, the, the material uh, in this chapter on the media. In terms of re recent trends, what have we seen recently in terms of the role of the media? Well, there is on the one hand the increasing concentration of ownership and uh, of all media sources, for example, newspapers. Almost half of all the daily newspapers 
are owned by the 12 largest newspaper chains. And almost 98% of all cities only have one newspaper. About 85% of all TV stations are affiliated with one of the three largest networks. So you see that idea of this increasing concentration of ownership. And ironically, even though we have more choices in terms of the sources that we have available, some, many of those choices are becoming concentrated into fewer and fewer hands. So does it really give you a choice sometimes? It makes you wonder. Um, more and more cities have no competing newspapers. Many years ago, particularly larger cities would have several newspapers, or at least two major newspapers. And, uh, but but that's, that's begin, you know, those daily newspapers are disappearing uh, almost every day. Uh, in fact, the entire newspaper industry is shrinking steadily as the number of electronic sources has increased, and they are really economically are hurting. Um, but that's one trend that we've seen uh, in the last several years, this increasing concentration of ownership of the media. In other words, again, I talked to you about that, that corporate bias, you know, these corporate conglomerates like Time Warner increasingly buying up more and more sources. I think of the corporation, you know, Gannett Corporation owning many newspapers all across the country. Um, again, you see, again, perhaps and there might be a corporate bias that's expressed in the content of the stories as part of that. A second uh, recent trend, and I think is this is again very, very important, is that because ra uh, the news is driven by ratings. Ratings determine the profit of, uh, for example, of news stations. Uh, and so there's more competition for ratings. So how does that affect the news? Well, you probably have already gotten a sense about how this affects the news because the news is going to report what people want to hear, what sounds good, what grabs their attention. Again, as we said before, you know, is there violence or scandal? You know, uh, um, some kind of news breaking stories. Those are the kinds of things that get people's attention. Um, there's a famous scholar in political science. He's at Harvard University. His name is Tom Patterson. And Tom Patterson is a, is a media expert. Um, and he, he's made th this argument, along with some others too, but he's been very good at articulating this argument. And that is, he, makes, he says that the media focus t has a to, to, focus to focus on sound bites that are the most interesting that may be easily, in fact, taken out of context. And so you're not really, you know, you, by focusing on the sound bites, you don't really understand the whole, th whole picture of what's going on. And um, because of this, you're only getting just a little bit of snippet of what it is. And again, it has very little substantive content. How, his, his, his frustration is that the media has the potential for playing such an important role and helping us to become more informed about our society, more informed about politics. And unfortunately, it doesn't really do a very good job in that regard because it is so busy about trying to, trying to grab people's attention to increase their ratings that it really does include very, very little substantive content. And along the same lines, you have, because of more and more pressure for good ratings, you have stories uh, or news programs like Nightline uh, or even 60 Minutes and others that for a long time have had a very good, solid reputation of being a reputable source of you know, news and commentary, being under a lot of pressure for, for these ratings are reporting things that, again, sound very sensationalistic. And so, uh, because again, that grabs people's attention. So they begin to sound a lot like other shows that are more entertainment oriented, like Entertainment Tonight, for example. And some of the things that you may see on a show like 60 Minutes versus Entertainment Tonight you know, if the same thing's being covered, there may not be a lot of difference in terms of the actual content of what's covered, too. The point here is that TV news has become packaged more and more designed to entertain viewers. The drive for ratings often drives the content that you see. And then, of course, the third and very important trend, and I think this is also a very good trend, is the growing use of it, the internet and blogs. That has a democratizing effect um, on our society, I believe. Uh, there are people who actively read and participate in blogs uh, and, and get their information from the internet, see these sources as an important alternative to the media. Oftentimes, the breaking news is immediately found on the internet and not edited or prepackaged to fit within the confines of a traditional broadcast format. Uh, technologies like YouTube and Twitter are examples of the new kinds of technologies um, and the new kinds of tools that provide an alternative to the traditional media, media in terms of getting information out in real time as events are happening. And we're seeing a lot more of that uh, every day. Today, uh, and during this segment, we're going to talk a, a few minutes about various kinds of constitutional issues that come into play.
um, and a couple of court cases that I want to want to bring up that are relevant to the role of the press and and newspapers and um, uh, a lot of this when we talk about the Constitution issue, issues this actually gets to the First Amendment uh, with the idea of the freedom of the press and freedom of the press goes along with freedom of speech and Historically, freedom of the speech and freedom of the press were derived historically from a basic concept based upon English common law. And that, 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 prior con that con basic concept was known as no prior restraint. And basically what no prior restraint suggests is that this, this held that censorship before publication was prohibited. But after publication, no protection was guaranteed. So after something was published, books could be banned, newspapers could be shut down. And in our country for most of the 1800s, the operating rule was no prior restraint. Now, a very famous court case happened in 1931. This court case was called Near versus Minnesota. This was again a First Amendment court case. The Supreme Court ruled that the First Amendment, freedom of speech in the press, upheld the idea of no prior restraint. There was a Minneapolis newspaper. The city of Minneapolis was trying to suppress the publication of this newspaper because the city officials, government officials there, did not like the fact that it kept writing articles that attacked those city officials as being corrupt. So the city officials were trying to shut the paper down. And they made the argument that this paper was not actually adhering to professional journalistic standards. It was just, just sensationalistic yellow journalism. The Supreme Court, however, said this. It said, even if this paper is, quote, depraved in its portrait of scandal, in other words, if it was fast and loose with the facts, it was still protected under the First Amendment. So that was a very important court case uh, that we saw. Now, there are times, however, when a paper might be censored in advance, but only in exceptional cases. And this is the idea of relating to national security. If it's during wartime, for example, or reporting on troop movements, then censorship before publication could be justified, but only in the most extreme matters of, of, um, of national security. And you have to understand what was the Supreme Court really trying to do here. Uh, on the one hand, it was trying to balance the needs of, you know, of individual rights, you know, that is you know, freedom of the press and balance to the idea of freedom of the press versus the needs of society. Sometimes the rights of society warrant the curtailment of individual rights. And the Supreme Court basically, whenever this happens, you know, when, when you have a conflict between individual rights and societal rights, the Supreme Court has to step in and define the boundaries between what's considered permissible versus impermissible restrictions of those freedoms of expression. Because we, this is what we're talking about, freedom of expression. So at times, the government may very well impose prior restraint, but again, ve for under very, very limited and exceptional, extreme kinds of purposes. Um, there was a discussion about uh, a, a progressive magazine and, how, and they wanted to publish an article that showed how to build a hydrogen bomb years later. And again, again that would be, might be something that where no prior restraint would not be applied because of the fact that we do not want to be providing information in national security to rogue countries about how to build a hydrogen bomb. Um, now, another interesting situation here is this is the right of journalists to protect their news sources. How far can this go? Uh, is this a privilege that reporters ought to be able to have under the First Amendment? If they're asked to report sources of information regarding some kind of trial and they say, I can't report my source because of confidentiality, you know, how far they, can they go? Well, interestingly, over half of the states have passed some kind of law to protect reporters from having to reveal their sources. And these are called shield laws. Um, some reporters have actually even gone to jail over, over some of these matters too because they've been found in contempt of, of, of the courts or in contempt of Congress who was in investigating uh, something going on about a particular news story that was, that was reported. But by and large, this is, this is a, a sort of a perpetual kind of issue or conflict that tries to draw it again 
on the one hand, the rights to uh, protect society versus the rights of the individual. Um, and, and so it does have a lot of First Amendment implications here. Um, another concept that comes along in the same area is this idea of libel. Um, is libel something that's constitutionally protected? And by and large, it's not. It, it is a, it's, you know, this deals with freedom of expression. But what libel is, is basically a false statement or defamation of character in printed form or by visual portrayal on television. Now, if somebody, if you are famous and somebody libels you, uh, uh, a magazine, you know, tells false stories about you, um, these, you can go to court, and often these courts are normally civil suits. And oftentimes it's for your own, for, you know, what's called for compensatory or punitive damages. It's based upon an individual's actual or potential financial losses that may accrue or potential loss of unemployment or income as a result of being libeled. Uh, so you see a lot of these kinds of cases that may happen between, say, you know, Hollywood actors and uh, some sensationalistic uh, outlets uh, that may have falsely uh, you know, spread false information about them. Um, often you, you hear about court cases. And oftentimes these, these, um, the, the actors uh, will, will win these cases. But by and large, libel is not protected by the First Amendment as terms, in terms of this. But, uh, so if the New York Times, especially as it, as it pertains to government officials, if the New York Times, for example, wants to run an article that criticizes the politician or questions his or her character and integrity, can, can that politician sue for libel? And the answer is probably not. On the other hand, if that person were not a public figure, that person probably could sue for libel, especially if the article was written with malice, and that is with knowledge that the information was, was false. But a different standard tends to apply to government officials because that's just in the form of political satire. It's very, very hard to make a convincing case that you can sue if you're a famous politician for libel um, in, in those kinds of cases. So can you run articles that attack government officials? Absolutely. If they're false lies you're spreading, can you still do that? Yes. Uh, can you sue in those kind of cases? You can, but it's hard to win, win cases in those kinds of uh, situations. If you are a public figure, it is harder to sue uh, for libel than if you are a private citizen. Now, a final point I want to talk about in terms of the text, and is, is, as the book talks about, the, the press or the media and the government are two adversaries on the one hand, but they also need each other as well. We talked earlier in the last segment, for example, about how the president can use the media to advance his policy agenda, how Congress can do that to a lesser degree. Uh, but again, that shows you as politicians using the media as a tool. Um, we see, for example, in some cases where the government has actually tried to manipulate the press to influence public opinion. Oftentimes, government officials will leak stories to the press such as to embarrass a political opponent in, in a campaign. We'll see that. So they'll use the media as a way to advance their interest. Uh, often lower level government officials will leak stories to the press. Part of that watchdog role, you know, whistleblowers, for example, may actually talk to journalists about things that are going on in government that they know of, and then, then, then the, the journalists will, will report a story. Probably the most famous of that would be with the Watergate. Uh, Woodward, Bob Woodward and uh, Bernstein, uh, reporters for the Washington Post, who through uh, a leak uh, investigated what was going on with the break-in of the Republican National Committee of the Watergate Hotel. And that, of course, led to the eventual resignation of Richard Nixon. So you see how, on the one hand, how people in government are actually using the press to in, in engage in that whistleblower role. Um, and potentially, again, they may do, be somewhat manipulative in terms of how they approach that. Uh, maybe, again, to embarrass uh, an official of the other party or something. Um, often the military will manipulate the kind of information that they give out to the press. We've seen this before, too, when we've had conflicts where they'll try to pr pr you know, put the military in the most favorable light as possible. Uh, during the uh, Iraqi invasion, uh, for example, in 2003, uh, a, a new concept was created in terms of relationship between the government and the press uh, known as the idea of embedded journalist, where the actual journalist would go in and actually be on the front lines with, uh, the, um, with the soldiers. Um, there was, on the one hand, that seen as a, being a positive idea because on the one hand you could really see what was going on at the front lines, but on the other hand, a lot of people criticized the media for doing this because they 
believe that it would basically mean that the journalists were kind of captive to the kinds of information uh, that, the, that, the, that the military really wanted to report to the journalist, and so therefore it would slander bias the journalist to be reporting in favor of government and not necessarily reporting on the full story, but just that which the government seemed to be the most favorable. But again, press conferences that military generals have given to, to, the, to the media, you know, are talking about different types of uh, advancements or progress that they've made. Um, oftentimes, uh, the Pentagon may tend to exaggerate some of its victories, uh, may downplay some of the fallout or the, the negative things that are occurring, uh, maybe some friendly fire or some other kinds of tragedies that may have happened, uh, may, may not get reported or may get downplayed. But again, this is an example of how you see on the one hand maybe the, the, the government trying to manipulate um, the media. Uh, on the other hand, the media, you know, as part of its, its profitability needs government access. And so officials in the media will try to curry favors with, you know, they'll try to curry good relationships with government officials so that they'll have access to government. And because without the access, then that hurts their ability to, to report on, on some of the stories and potentially uh, their, their profitability and their ratings. So there's a relationship between the government and the media, often characterized on the one hand by suspicion of the motives of each, and on the other hand, one that recognizes their mutual need for each other. So it's a bit of a symbiotic relationship. It's a symbiotic relationship um, where, where they, they mutually, you know, you know, they need each other, but at the same time, they, they treat each other with a bit of a grain of salt and distrust, if you will, because of the fact that they realize that one could be trying to manipulate the other. This wraps up our discussion and talking about the role of the media in society, and I uh, hope you found this informative. Uh, during our next discussion, we're going to be talking about public opinion and the various factors that influence your opinion, the, the different things and different factors that influence your viewpoints about government. We'll, we'll move on from there, talking about other kinds of issues like voting behavior and other aspects of political participation. So for now, this is Patrick Scott signing off. We'll see you next time.